take your seats. We're fixing to begin this today. Okay. First of all, uh, we'd like to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, we're really excited to, to get the This is Texas Freedom Force chapter up and running here in Dallas, Texas. And uh, we've got one of our our new coordinators, uh, Mr. Ben, that put this together, and we appreciate it. Ben Ballard, can you stand up right quick so people can see you? If you guys have any questions uh, for Ben, you can hit him up after this, and uh, he can talk to you as well as uh, any of the other directors that are here. Uh, we're very, very thankful to have Representative Slayton here today, as well as Dr. Tim Wesley, the Republican Party historian. And uh, we wanted to let those guys uh, have a chance to talk to you guys and, and uh, converse with you so that you can hear some of the same stuff we've been hearing for quite some time. And uh, so without further ado, uh, Representative Slayton, would you come on up? Thank you all so much for having me. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, my district is not very far. If you know where Rockwell is, I'm just on the east side of there. Hunt, Hopkins, and Manzac counties, which the cities there, Greenville, Sulphur Springs, and Camp. And, uh, but I work in Dallas. I was actually raised not too far from here with the North Mesquite High School. Any of you that are close to here. But, uh, you know, I just finished up my first session down in Austin. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, it, it's really sad to see that, you know, as you, as you uh, talk to friends and family and voters in November, December, right, I mean, whenever everything happened with the election, and then of course, you know, think about even in, in January, uh, in February, as, as uh, the new administration gets in and they start, I mean, advancing their agenda, you know, and starts, um, uh, Get rid of things that Trump had done and other things, and and you see the desperation. People worried for their country, worried for the economy, worried for their family. Worried. I mean, we got with all everything going on with COVID, we had people dying alone. You know, uh, I, I'm not a Catholic, but people that are Catholic were, were dying alone and not able to have last rites. There were so many things going on, and just you know, fear and concern for America, and we have. A lot of Republican leaders down in Austin that have no sense of urgency. I mean, no sense of urgency at all, and that's what's sad. And, you know, we, this great group, been been fighting to protect Alamo, and and um, we get in session, and there's no urgency with so many things. But but the left, they are relentless. They come after us with everything they got. One little example of that is uh, Biederman's Alamo Bill. I was so happy to be helping him. I was happy he asked me to help him. There was a, a rep not too far from here that filed an amendment that uh, was basically a, just an attack at him for his other bill, Texit. And, um, and I was able to help uh, get a point of order and kill that. And uh, that was a lot of fun to help him fight because he was he was surrounded. He had the Democrats coming after him, and he had people in his own party coming after him. And it was really sad to see when he had this this battle going on on the floor and his bill to protect the Alamo. He's getting it from everywhere, but just a handful of people. And we were fighting, 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 and finally he was like, "All's lost." They they done. It. We had no support. Um, I was even trying to ask the caucus to send out a text message to tell everyone to follow the author, follow Biederman. This is something that we do to protect bills and amendments that we like as Republicans, supposedly. <laughs> and um, they wouldn't do it. So there was there was no leadership to help him. They left him high and dry. But you know, I was happy to 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 be there by his side on that. But. I say that's the problem, is we don't have a sense of urgency from our leaders. And um, you know, I'm not sure why that's the case. Um, I just know that we have urgency. We, we have, uh, we, we're responding to what the left is wanting to do to our country. And, and you think about in, in history, um, um, I mean, I believe in monument protection and, and protecting history so many on so many different levels, you you, know, you you study history and you got the um, the uh, library in Alexandria, 
in, in Egypt, right? And and if you study history of, uh, of Islam, everywhere they would go and, and conquer, they would destroy history. And we even saw that up, you know, in, in recent in uh, Iraqi freedom and in Afghanistan, especially in Iraqi freedom, they go into, um, you know, any site, old tombs, um, they'd start des destroying tombs. I don't know if you know St. Nicholas, right? Santa Claus. You know, he, they had to exhume his body and move his body uh, from Africa because the Muslims were going to destroy that. Then you have at the library in Alexandria. You have, do you know that in that, in that library, you know, back then they, they had how to remove a tumor. They, they had procedures in removing tumors. They also had uh, umbra, right? And, and we lost a lot of, of history there. Why? Because they just wanted to wipe out. When they, when they, when they conquered someone, they wanted to, to wipe out their history, wipe out any uh, reference to them. And that was just a, a way that people did it back then. Now, and so now we have the left literally removing things right in front of us, changing things right in front of us. And... Um, uh, in, anyway, I hope we can get more elected officials um, to fight. It, even if it's some of the same ones. If you go back and you talk to your elected official and give them an education. Get them to where they'll fight with us. Hey, we'll take, we'll take someone that wakes up and wants to fight with us. But if we have new ones, we want new people that are willing to fight. I will tell you a, an update, and I may be... Uh, uh, and I, I won't say too much. I'll let him explain more, Dr. Wesley, because he was at the, the SRAC meeting. But I had people telling me, um, you know, we're going to have a special session. Um, the governor Abbott said we're going to have one in October or so for redistricting. Well, we're going to have another one sometime this summer. And uh, the SRECs, the State Republican Executive Committee, they just voted to put five things. Um, it's, a, it's a letter or a resolution requesting we put some, uh, the governor Abbott put some issues on there uh, on the docket to, for us to vote and one of them is on protection. So that is that is fantastic. I want mean, him to go into more detail. I, I, I had people calling me and I was like, well, I'm going to let them know. Uh, and so we, you know, the grassroots is still fighting, still urging and, um, and and we have to we have to keep fighting. We have to find a way to make them listen to us. Hope or, or get new people in there. Really, what we need to do. But um, um, a few things just to tell you what, what's been been going on that's, that's been interesting. Um, so I'll mention real quick with border security. You know, all these past few sessions, we've had Republicans say, oh, we did this for border security, or we did that. Talk, mainly talking about putting more money towards it. Well, we have the worst situation we've had ever going on right now. And what's interesting, so I, I filed a bill to uh, uh, finish Trump's wall. And uh, what's interesting, all along the border, you see a lot of Democrat counties. You really do, for, historically. Now, some of those counties were still, quote, Democrat counties, but they voted for Trump because of border security, because of the wall. And that was before the situation is what it is in the past two or three months. Well, people down there, elected officials and others, reached out to me, and they were wanting my help because I had the bill to finish the wall. We send the bill to the federal government. I mean, there, there's, I don't think there's anything in the Constitution that keeps us from standing up for ourselves. It, nothing stops us. Nothing prevents us from protecting ourselves. And in fact, over 20 counties in South Texas have filed emergency declarations because of the amount of human smuggling. You heard that. Because of the amount of human smuggling going on. There's estimations that the cartels are making anywhere from 11 to, to 21 million dollars a week. Okay, I've talked to sheriffs down there that uh, it was in the month of May. They've already blown their budget for body bags. Yeah. Think about that. These are these are small counties. 
Uh, their, their, their industry is agriculture, hunting, things like that. And, and so they don't have large budgets as a county altogether. And they have blown their budget on body bags in May. And that's not even the busy months, June, July, August. And these, some of these are, are they're Democrats. But you know what? They want to protect the border. And what's crazy, we have them filing these emergency uh, declarations. We have them calling, reaching out to me and others that, to come down. With, they need they want they need help with the border. They need security. And Republicans aren't acting. And so that that just kind of goes into what I was sharing earlier. Is we have a problem with with Republican leadership not acting in urgency. You know, no matter the issue, we're worried about our economy, we're worried about our future, we're worried about religious liberty, we're worried about monument protection, we're worried about the border. We don't act with urgency, or at least our leaders. So that's why it's so important y'all are here. It's so important that Texas Freedom Force is here because we have to continue to educate people what's going on with all of these issues. And, um, and we were talking about what San Antonio is looking to do. We have to educate people. Um, um, and, and that's that's all we can do. Educate and be engaged. Because if you don't know what's going on, they're going to steamroll you. That's the bottom line. But, um, um, and I will tell you, uh, before I started a uh, session, um, uh, I went on to the house floor. I, I'd been there as a guest, you know, as a visitor on tour and all that. And I always knew it was there, but I never could go over there buy it. No, I think I could, but only a few times. There's a painting on, on the wall of, uh, do y'all know who Dick Dowling is? Brave Dick Dowling. Anybody know who he is? Well, he's one of my favorite people in Texas history. And, uh, I, and so I, I get this tour as a freshman, uh, a new member orientation, and I said, I've got to go get my picture by Brave Dick Dowling. There's a picture over there of Audie Murphy, and then the, a little further down was Dick Dowling. Well, he was a Confederate soldier, and he's uh, famous for the Battle of Sabine Pass. So when you come in the Capitol, the main entrance, and you've got you know, on, on the floor the, all the where the battles were in Texas, you have them on the floor, well, Sabine Pass is, is one of them. And uh, I said, i got to get my picture by him. And I did. I got my picture by Dick Dowling's portrait. And then there was a replica in the clerk's office. And the preservation board was like, man, I'm so glad you know and like who Dick Downing is. And uh, they said that there was a movement to go after and remove these. And they thought in the rules debate that that's when the Democrats would come and try to remove uh, different people because this guy was a Confederate soldier. And uh, uh, I, didn't, I was so busy, I didn't pay attention, but they actually removed those paintings off the house floor without saying a word. I found out in the last two or three weeks because I didn't walk in every day and look at the paintings on the wall. I mean, my wife would accuse me of not paying attention to the details also. Okay, so this is not abnormal for me. But I realized it was missing. And it was taken down without saying a word. Now, now who brave Dick Dowling is? Um, so it was during the Civil War, and the Union Navy was going to come up Sabine Pass. Now, of course, fighting men were all off <laughs> elsewhere. There was no one here to defend Texas. Of course, Texas was supplying a lot for the Confederate Army. But what we had left here was families, Texans, people who say I'm a fifth generation Texan, sixth generation Texan today. They, in some cases, depending on where they are, they might owe Brady Dick Dowling. So they only had a few hundred guys, and they had this little fort, and they didn't have, they had some cannons, but they weren't that, uh, they, they, they didn't go that far. And so what they did is they put these markers in Sabine Pass from here to here. He said, guys, we can only hit here. Now, they're going to be coming in, and they can shoot from a lot further off. So we got to just keep our head down, survive the bombardment, and then when they get within there, just let them have it. And that's what they did. They, they kept their head down, took a beating, and then they get within these pylons, and they start letting them have it. Well, they got a lucky shot on the second ship right in the rudder, turned it sideways. The first ship, Union ship, had it gone all the way up the Sabine River, it could have conquered Texas by itself. I mean, it could. 
but it came around, it turned around to come back to help. And got right back inside the pylon, and they let them have it, and they wound up capturing the Union Navy. They, they, they surrendered. They saved Texans. And and there's Texans that are alive. There, there's um, people that are able to have the legacy of being a Texan because of brave Dick Dowling. He was fighting for for Texans' lives, economy, and everything. It, it been, there was no chance, no chance against that Navy. And, and, and he's just a, a famous Texan that I cherish and love uh, because he, he, he was bold and he was brave. And as most of y'all believe, that's why we remember history. That's why we study history. Yeah, there's things in history we study because we don't want to repeat it, obviously. But there's times in history you learn because you see the bravery of men. And you think to yourself, well, should I be brave? Should I be bold? And without those examples, you might think, well, that's not normal. Maybe I shouldn't be. Maybe I should just sit down and shut up. But you, you, you see others in history that speak up, that are bold, that act. And that strikes a nerve in us. And what I believe is, is, is Christians. We need to stand up for what we believe. We need to not be ashamed, be afraid. And 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 so, anyway, I, I thank you all for having me. And I just want to tell you some things that were kind of going on for a rookie. Um, I was happy to fight where I could. Um, um, I filed a monument protection bill, um, and it was... Uh, they, they heard a bunch of bills, but some of my other activities um, upset the chairman to where he wasn't going to let me have a hearing. So I was, I was punished for that, but there were some others that moved, but still nothing happened. But the great news we have, hopefully the governor's going to listen to SRAC, uh, their resolution, to y'all, to others, and will put monument protect, protection on the docket. That's all we can hope for, yeah. right? That's all we can hope for. Um, but with that, I mean, if you have any couple questions, I don't know how you know, time or whatever, but I'll be happy to take a couple questions, try to answer what I can, if you have time. We've got plenty of time. Okay. Anybody have questions? Yes, sir. Just out of curiosity, when they took the uh, picture down in Portugal, you mentioned who authorized that? That's a great question. So, all, what I do know from what I learned is there's not one painting that hangs in the Capitol that doesn't have approval of the legislature <clears throat> through our history. Right. If there's a painting hanging on the wall, a legislative body voted to allow that to hang. And uh, at some point, someone voted to allow this Dick Dowling painting, and I believe it was the reproduction or whatever um, that was put up. But then apparently Rick Perry found the original and donated it and they just replaced it. They put the original up right there and then this clerk had it with 10 other pictures. It's not like the only one. And um, and so I don't know who authorized it other than the House Preservation Board themselves. But considering the legislature has to approve them to be hung, I don't know how, I, I don't know how that happened. I'm going to ask some questions. I will tell you, I reached out to the Preservation Board and I was wanting to know if I could look at their replica paintings because I might want to hang one in my office, but they shut me down and told me. So, um, but uh, I can look into that. And, and, and I, I do intend to, trip, to figure out how that happened. Albert Carousel, I live right here in Southlake, Texas. I'm a native Houstonian. I moved up here about 20 years ago. Uh, my success as an entrepreneur uh, in the North Texas area has been uh, one of the long road of hard work. I'm third generation, obviously a Hispanic and Latin uh, background. And Texas is very important to me. It's my home, it's my country. What I appreciate what's happened recently in Southlake was they were able to band together and throw out the critical race theory in the school systems. Yeah. And worked real hard on that. And it was thrown out 70 to 30. Mm -hmm. right. It was a blowout. 
Now, Great Line College, though, is having a runoff because of that. Now, the final was supposed to be yesterday. I don't know what happened, but uh, one of the things that I keep hearing over and over and over again is, and I don't like to call it red or blue or Republican, Democrat. I, I kind of see things that you see the right or it's wrong. There you go. And <clears throat> what I hear the wrong is they're organized. They're very organized. And I think the biggest problem as, as the people who are on the right is that we're so busy working. We're so busy trying to take care of our families because innately we do what's right. And we got our heads buried in the sand because they got us so busy doing what we're supposed to do in everyday life. We expect people in Congress, in the Senate, in our legislators to be doing their job, and we turn around, they're not. They're already doing these crazy agendas and items. So more and more people are waking up, but now that they are waking up, what can we do to organize and get organized to do what we've been able to do in South Lake and continue that throughout Texas so we can start really pushing back these agendas that really don't hold the true character of our great state. Yeah, and, and absolutely, South Lake deserves credit on that. They really did. They organized a school board election against one issue, critical race theory, which is cultural Marxism, okay? And, and, and that's all it is, cultural Marxism. And, and, and cultural Marxism exists to divide people. You create you know, different groups, right? You got based on poverty, based on gender, based on race, based on whatever. And you just, you just keep dividing people and breaking them up. And then you figure out who gets the advantage or who gets punished. And, um, and so it, it was fantastic they, they stopped it. Um, and, and I do, uh, and I, I hear what you're saying on how we're busy and they keep throwing things at us. I feel like it's like uh, we, we have a, a house at the bottom of a hill and they're up top and it's snow covered and they're just up there making a snowball and throwing it down the hill and by the time it gets to us, it's a big snowball. And we're trying to stop it. And we got all of our energy to stop this thing coming at our house. And what are they doing? They're making another little snowball and they're starting and throwing another one. And so, yes, they're organized. They seem to have us on our heels. And, and, and uh, my only suggestions is we have to, to model like what Southlake did and others have done. And, and what it is, it, it's communicate and, and educate. I know people say that a lot, but we have to. And we have to be uh, smart about it. Like, for instance, you, um, I, I mentioned to people, when it comes to educating on, on issues and other things, you look at free market economics. Okay, I love telling people this because a lot of people don't know this. We weren't taught in school. We're taught that the... the the author and the, the main person who started teaching free market economics was Adam Smith. Okay? In fact, he stole that idea from the Solomonkian monks. It was a group of monks using scripture to teach about economics, ethics, theology of work. They were, they were teaching good biblical instruction. That didn't come from just, it's not just some secular idea, it actually comes from scripture. And, and so my suggestion is, is, one, we've got to have pastors start leading and teaching because it's about right and wrong, okay? It's about right and wrong. You, and, and so we've got to have that. We've got to have people with what we're doing here and what they did in Southlake. They, they met with people, hey, here's the problem with critical race theory. It's only going to divide us more. It's only going to, it's not going to teach things that, that help make us great as a country where we focus on being Americans and Texans instead of dividing people and pitting people against each other. And, and so we have to find a way to get engaged because here's why. We, when we get like some outside group coming in from wherever, it could, they could be from Austin, they could be from out of state, well, it's easy to discredit that because they're like, oh, you know, you know like even with y'all, a lot of you guys are San Antonio. Why it's great you have these chapters in, in, in Dallas and Houston because like, oh, those are just those San Antonio guys. But you get people here in the Metroplex. 
And you're like, no, 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 I'm a neighbor. I, I mean, I live close to you here, and we need to stand up against this. It helps to have people here local. It's going to help to to have pastors be leaders. That's a part of it. And, and we have to build relationships with people because a lot of times when we talk to people, you know, they may be mad at, at an idea or something because they saw, you know, Facebook or, or just cultures against it. But you start talking to people about the issues. They're going to care about fam family values. They're going to care uh, about a good economy. I mean, I, I, mean, I can, our, our family business, we, we do taxes, bookkeeping, payroll, really boring stuff. But one thing's funny is we help people, Republican and Democrat. We help, we help people. We don't ask them, you know, are you Republican? You know, we, we help everybody. And I can tell you, we help family. We have family that are Democrats. I know they're Democrats. Okay, and I, I'm a Republican. What's funny is, is when we talk about issues on policy, they love more taxes, more government, more everything, but whenever we do their taxes for them, they want us to save them the maximum amount we can. Right. <laughs> and so that's where we really get into the, to the, like, um, it, it, and the reason I bring that up is, is building relationships with people. You build relationships with people and you continue to, to, to talk and fight on these issues. That, that's, and like I say, I don't know if I have a, a great answer other than continue to build your network, continue to meet people. For instance, I, I live over in Royce City, and it was about six or seven years ago, there was a company from North Dallas trying to build a toll road. Okay, do you know in both party platforms, they're against toll roads, Republican and Democrat. This company, uh, they didn't even fill out their paperwork. Like they, uh, When they were filing to operate a business, they weren't even allowed to work in Hunt County. But they were getting red carpet treatment to put in a road that wasn't needed. We citizens were using TxDOT's population projection numbers. They wouldn't reference where their numbers came from. They were just inflated, higher than ours. And well, TxDOT's, they weren't our numbers. So we were trying to stop this toll road. We had 800 people show up to a meeting in Levon. The fire marshal shut it down because we packed out the room. Um, then we had another meeting in Rockwall that a couple thousand people were at, and we were still fighting it. And y'all know what I'm talking about. You have all, no one shows up to city council meetings. No one shows up to commissioner's court. But we had tons of people there in opposition. We were luckily able to stop this toll road. But what happened is, is as we began to talk to people about the issue, about the fact that the road wasn't needed, they weren't legally able to operate, and we started talking about the family businesses that were going to be affected, possibly some churches, cemetery, and other things, and how it affects the economy. Because if you have a business off a toll road versus a, a free road, you put you at a disadvantage. So I, I'm, I'm speaking and trying to, and I don't, I don't think I have the best answer, sir. I'm speaking from. What I've done when we stopped the toll road, what South Lake did, which I know about what they did, they just engaged the community. And I don't know how we reduplicate that for a statewide. I, I'm going to be honest. I don't know how we do reduplicate that for e even a state rep. It's difficult, you know, because when you get into the urban area, you're going to have a, a smaller geographic, geographic area, but you're going to have a lot of gated communities. A lot of apartments you can't get into. A lot of things like that. And then um, you just got the sheer size of you know three or four counties out in the rural. I don't know. That's why my suggestion and, and is it's going to have to be more than just a group of people here, a group of business people here. And that's why I also said we have to have pastors. Because, I mean, our, our Declaration of Independence, over 30 of them have been to some form of seminary. There were pastors, that, the Black Robe Regiment, that were, were helping the founding of our country. We have to have pastors engaged, talking on the issues. Um, so there's a lot of things we need in our country. I, 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 and I wish I had a more concise thing, uh, answer for you, because we are, in, we are in desperate need of leadership everywhere. We're in desperate need of leadership, my opinion, behind the pulpit, 
in the community, in our politics. I really do. I mean, I think a lot of our politics is ran by consultants and lobbyists. People are making decisions not on conviction, right? Not on the conviction they have of what's right and wrong. They're making it based on a consultant saying, hey, you might want to think about how this is going to affect your voting base, this age group, this demographic, this, this. And, the, and they choose to not act. Um, or they worry about the lobby. They worry, worry about the, uh, the spigot being cut off. They're not going to get the large donation checks. And instead of just people saying, you know, I'm going to... I'm going to run, and this is how I, I tried to work this session. And I've created some enemies, and I, I'm told I'm number one on their hit list for redistricting, which is fine. But I told people, I'm, I've got two years. I'm going to make the most of these two years. And if it's done, it's done. That's fine. But at least years from now, I'm not going to look back and say, man, I really wish I would have done this or done that. So that, that's where we got to get to, is we got to get back to, to men being men, fighting on conviction, because that's the only way we're going to stop what the left have, because they are organized. I mean, they are. And um, so anyway, I, I'm, I don't know. I wish I had something simple. I wish I had a quick fix. I just tell you, that's what's what on my heart, but I don't... And I don't even know if what I, I'm saying is sufficient because there's we got so many problems. I, I can just tell you that because we, we are busy. That that's the the biggest challenge for me running is the fact that you know I, I work. I probably work more than any other member of the Texas House. I, I'm, I'm not independently wealthy, and so um, uh, it, it makes it very difficult to get involved. Anyway, any other? Any other questions? Well, thank you all so much for having me. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here, and y'all keep up the good work and the good fight, and uh, we'll keep poking along with this, and, and we're going to try to um, protect Texas and protect our country. that represent what the grassroots stand for. Right. Brian Slayton is one of those reps. And it's up to us. I, don't, I just read a, an article today talking, uh, was put out, I think, by uh, Texas Monthly, which is usually kind of far left to begin with. But they were talking about the governorship and how uh, uh, Senator Huffines is running for governor and, and then uh, also we might see Alan West throw his hat in the ring as well, et cetera, et cetera. And they said that, uh, you know, as individuals, these guys aren't that threatening, but they have the grassroots behind them, and they make a lot of noise. And so when it comes to time for re-election, as an organization, since we're a nonprofit, we can't endorse people, but we can make a lot of noise for people like Representative Brian Slayton and make sure that people that listen to us are in office. So. With that, uh, I'm going to move to the main event of this. Uh, Dr. Tim Wesley is nice enough to come up here and, and uh, talk about our history and the Republican Party's history. So with that, I give him a warm welcome for Dr. Tim Wesley. yesterday uh, with the state republican executive committee meeting so as i mentioned i'm the historian for the republican party of texas so i was there on uh, last evening i had to speak there to give a report um, as historian what's taking place throughout the state what we've been doing also i had to do a report this morning um, as the uh, president of 150 first black men of texas which many didn't know that the Republican Party of Texas was started by 150 black men and 20 Anglos on July 4th of um, 1867. And so sharing that history, um, 
coming here and being a part of what you all have going on is just as important as what we were doing there. I thank uh, Representative uh, Slayton for his words and deed. Um, I heard about Representative Slayton uh, being a champion for the people and my wife just echo says, he sounds like you. <laughs> so, uh, which is a great thing in that um, believing in what you're doing and making sure that you're not concerned about what will happen, but what's happening right now is extremely important. So when I think about This is Texas Freedom Force, I recall when I first encountered This is Texas Freedom Force, um, I found myself, I was an employee at San Antonio College, and I was working on um, all things finances for them at the time, and I remember seeing a friend of mine talk about Uh, the defense of the cenotaph and how there was going to be a rally and a meeting and people were going to be talking about defending it. And I said, well, you know what? I should be there. <laughs> He went live on Facebook, so I said, I should be there. So I decided I'm going to take my lunch break and I'm going to go around and I'm going to stand up as an individual, as a citizen, as a patriot, as a person that loves Texas, loves America. I will go around. So I went around and lo and behold, they weren't there. So I call up a friend, I said, hey, where are you all at? He says, we're around the corner uh, doing some testimonies. So I said, okay, I'll go and testify. I got there and realized it was almost time for my lunch to be over. <laughs> so I said, I'm going to do the right thing and go back to work. And I said, if God's will that I speak uh, on the cenotaph and the fifth area of cenotaph um, in itself being spirit of sacrifice, as some call it the empty tomb, I said, I'll go and speak on this because uh, that's what it is, spirit of sacrifice. So I went back to work that day and I uh, watched the clock and I said, well, it's almost five o'clock. I can go ahead and leave now. And I said, God, again, if it's your will, I get a chance to speak. Lo and behold, I get to the location where everyone was at and they had a sign-in sheet to speak about uh, defense of the cenotaph. And I signed in and I was the last person they allowed to sign in. <laughs> which meant that I ended up being the last person they allowed to speak, which meant that God's timing was perfect, <laughs> right? So as I spoke, I share with the body at the time why it's important to make sure that we protect that cenotaph and not move it. One, when it comes down to just the pure logistics of moving it, they could not move a small statue without breaking it. They were surely going to destroy this. And with the destruction of the cenotaph, you have the destruction of history. And with the destruction of history, you have an opportunity and a platform for revisionist history to creep in. And with revisionist history creeping in, you can put that into the textbooks. Once it's placed into the textbooks, you can place it into the classrooms. Once in the classrooms, you can place it into the hands of children. Once in the hands of children, you can place it into these adults. And once it's in these adults, generations later, all the history that really mattered and that was true is now erased and you have a generation that has no clue about the truth. And we have people like TITFF that's fighting to make sure that people know the true history. Right. So it's a lot to it. So I explained to him several things. Today you see me standing here with a shirt with some numbers on it. 1776. People will look at that shirt. Many will know what the 1776 is. 1776 is unique. But if we go a year back, we go to April 18th of 1775. You may have heard of the old statement of term, the shot heard around the world. April 18th is a special day. That was the day I was born, but not in 1775. <laughs> I thought it was unique that God allowed me to be born on the same day. I'm talking about uh, hundreds of years later, but the same day whereby this great event took place, April 18th, 1775. Citizens decided, you know what, we're going to stand up and we're going to fight for our freedom. And it was the kickoff of the American Revolution. And at that point, by the time we get to 1776, July 4th of 1776, we find America in its birthing. We find ourselves being free. We find ourselves being a nation. We find 13 colonies saying we're going to enjoy this freedom. Yes, yes. yes. So I found myself in a situation where when I was looking at the shirt, I said, 1776, hmm, should I get the shirt or not? I said, historically, I said, it says a lot. But I said, in 1776, my ancestors were still slaves. My ancestors were still enslaved in 1776. It wouldn't be until the Emancipation Proclamation, a long, long time afterwards, 
that my ancestors will find freedom. And it wouldn't be until June 13th, June 18th rather, as we now know it as uh, Juneteenth, that our ancestors would find themselves being free even in the great state of Texas. But I'm talking about a mighty, mighty long time later. So why wear the shirt, 1776? Why speak about and why represent something that during that time my ancestors were still enslaved? Because I benefited from it. I still benefit from it. Because if there was not an April 18, 1775, whereby we had some citizens to stand up and say it's time for us to get from under Great Britain's rule, it's time for us to fight for our freedoms, it's time for us to get our independence, it's time for us to be independent. If we didn't have them fighting then, even as we fast forward, I wouldn't be enjoying the freedoms that I have today. said in Austin at a rally, like it, love it, or hate it, it's still history. Like it, love it, or hate it, it's still history. When I think about what I've seen TITFF do, I think about scripture as well. I think about the scripture that God tells us in uh, Romans chapter 12 where he talks about the body. He talks about there are different parts of the body and all the parts of the body, they, they must be dependent upon one another. One can't say they don't need the other. I think about TITFF and I think about the fact this is a part of the body that we need. I'm over at the State Republican Executive Committee meeting, but TITFF, they're out on the front lines. They're holding the line. They're in the midst of the battle. Come on, somebody. <laughs> so when we look at organizations like this, there are some things that my hands can do that my feet can't. Are y'all with me so far? There are some things my eyes can do that my ears can't. There are some things that TITFF can do that the SREC cannot do, that the average Republican cannot do. There are some places they can go that the average Republican or the average Democrat or the average Independent or the average Green Party citizen cannot go and do. There are some stances that they can take that the average person cannot take. There are some things about history they can talk about the average person cannot do. There are some stories that TITFF can say they can say that we were at the Alamo and we held the line. the average citizen would be afraid to show up. They went and they went with arms and I'm reminded of Nehemiah chapter 4. In Nehemiah chapter 4, there was a threat against God's people. And this threat against God's people at the time required Nehemiah to talk to all those that were in charge. And he told them, and I'm going to put it in layman's terms from Nehemiah 4, I need y'all to strap up. I need y'all to come locked and loaded. And as I heard my friend say many times, you need to get your battle rattled together. <laughs> As they got it together, they had things in one hand, their tools in one hand, and they had their weapons in another. As they worked with one hand, they had their weapons in another. So when people wonder, why is it that TITFF show up with their weapons? Because I need you to understand, it's about the spirit of sacrifice. Not all are willing to do it, but this organization is. Yeah. Everybody talks a good game, but who shows up for battle? Everybody talks one. So when I think about this, I, I, I think about the fact that God's will and how he had things set up. I spoke at that Cenotaph uh, meeting at that point, and I spoke, and as I spoke, I didn't know Brandon at the time, President of uh, This Is Texas Freedom Force, didn't know him, but I got a call from him. And he says, hey, um, I heard you speak at the Alamo uh, Defense, and I heard you speak about the Cenotaph. We have a rally coming up. One of the things that happened in March of that year, I was running for U.S. Congress. I was a congressional candidate, third time around for CD15 of Texas. And I recall saying, well, though I did not get the election won, though I fell short, I knew that as an individual, as a patriot, as a citizen, I cannot stop. I knew that no matter whether I win, lose, or draw, I cannot stop. No matter what, I must keep pressing forward. When I look at crowds like yourself, and I count and I say, okay, there are less than two dozen people in here, but I think about the heart of just one. Yes. All it takes is the heart of just one. I had a heart to keep working, and I told my wife after that election of March of 2020, I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write that book on history that God placed in my heart to write. I wrote that book on history. I, I want to digress to progress. Sometimes, patriots, it's about showing up. Sometimes it's about showing up. I showed up to testify. And in showing up to testify, I was the last one to speak. 
God used my voice at that moment to connect me with Brandon. From that point, I was invited out in the midst of writing this book on history. Get a call later. Brandon says, you know, and by the way, next week, Chairman Alan West will be there as well. He wasn't chairman at the time. He was running for chairman for the Republican Party of Texas. I said, great. He's one of the six people or seven people I have on my list to do the foreword for my new book. So I'll ask him while we're there. All right. So lo and behold, God saw fit that when I asked him within 10 minutes, he said, yes, I'll do it. <laughs> Had no clue. All right, that's all right. Go ahead and clap for that. I had no clue that at that moment, you know, we would connect beyond just that textbook at the time. I had no clue that you know, shortly after you would write and say, hey, when I'm elected, would you fill one of the seats that I have in mind? I said, absolutely. The seat I was going to fill, it didn't happen. He calls back and says, hey, I have a role for historian. So God saw fit. I wrote a book on history before I was ever appointed as historian. It only takes one. As a historian, I went around and have been going around the great state of Texas talking about the need to protect history. I went to a small town uh, called Taylor, Texas. And in Taylor, Texas, I've had a, a group that was far smaller than the amount of people that's in here. And I had someone ask me a profound question. They said, you know, Dr. Wesley, it's only a few of us in here. Why did you drive this far for just a handful of us? I said, you know, it only takes one match to start a forest fire. Amen. Just one match to start a forest fire. All it takes is one of you patriots, just one of you patriots to stand up and say, we're going to hold the line. All it takes is just one patriot to say, we refuse to lose. All it takes is just one patriot to ignite the many. Just one patriot. And I told her, that one patriot may be in this room. Today I tell you, why are you here? Because that one patriot may be in this room. That one patriot I know for a fact is in this room. We have multiple patriots, and I know this for a fact because I've seen them at work. I recall when we had BLM show up at the Alamo during the time that these great defenders of TITFF was there, and they were there because the cenotaph was defaced. And they were there doing what they had been doing for a mighty long time. And I recall Brandon was doing an interview at the time, and he's caught up with the camera in his face, and he's doing an interview. And I recall TITF holding the line to protect this monument. And as they were holding the line, I saw a crowd coming, and I saw problems starting to emerge. And I remember God speaking to me and said, you came down with your clergy collar on. You came down with your American flag over your shoulder. You came down with the petition in your hand. God says, Brandon is occupied. T-I-T-F-F is occupied. But sir, you're not. You came down here covered with insurance by USAA for your life. <laughs> and you're covered with the grace of God and you're covered with the mercy of Jesus. Stand up, young man, and go and speak. So I remember going because it only takes one. I remember walking in boldness and I remember standing for the moment between TITFF and BLM and I remember talking to them about their issues and I remember telling them that the guys that you're coming up against right here, you're coming against the wrong people. I remember asking BLM, I said, what are you here for? What are you trying to get done? Oh, we're trying to make sure that we come up against people like this. We're trying to come up against them. They're the problem. And I said, do you want to stop all the stuff that's going on with police and, and with the African Americans? Absolutely. I said, would you be willing to sign a petition for that? Absolutely we will. I said, well, guess what? All these guys holding these weapons have already signed a petition. <laughs> Join them in signing it. You have the wrong group of people that you're coming up against. Oh, come on for just a moment. They're protecting these monuments. So I remember just watching these guys at work. So for whoever may be watching not at that, that are not here, I want to let you know this is a class act organization. Class act, they've been protecting monuments. I remember we went to San Jacinto. Brandon called me out to go to San Jacinto. If you don't know about San Jacinto in the Houston area, it is the tall 
tallest war monument in the world, the tallest one in the world. We know that with the Battle of the Alamo, that took place over 90 minutes. At the Battle of the Alamo, we had about 200 defenders. At that time, that 200 defenders, as I prepare to prepare the way to get you to San Jacinto, I got to tell you about the Battle of the Alamo, and then I'll tell you about San Jacinto, 90 minutes long. That was the Battle of the Alamo, 90 minutes long. Why is this so instrumental? Because the Battle of the Alamo is what set the foundation and set the tone for us becoming the great state of Texas, the only state in the nation that have flown the flags of six different countries. Are y'all with me so far? I remember hearing about the story. We've all heard about the story, or you hear the term, come and take it. We know about Gonzalez. Come and take it. Come and take it. But many don't know there were about three uh, dozen men or so that decided from Gonzalez that they were going to march in. And these men marched in, and some say miraculously, they marched in through enemy lines. As they marched in through enemy lines, they knew that the Texas that they were living in, it was so important that they had to stand up for it. Now, I need to tell you, digress to progress, this is the history they're trying to erase. Yeah. This is the history they don't want the next generation to know. So these men, as they made their way in, they knew without a doubt, many knew our lives on the line. We may not come out of this thing alive, but it's so worth it. And there was one by the name of Jim Bowie. Jim Bowie had gotten a message from Sam Houston. He got the message that, hey, there's just not enough men. There's just not enough men to hold San Antonio. Go and get the men out of there, and I'm going to paraphrase. Get the men out of there. Get our equipment out of there. It's just not enough to hold San Antonio. But Jim had other thoughts in mind. Jim believed that this was indeed worth fighting for. He believed it was worth fighting for it, so Jim went, and instead of telling the colonel at the time what he was told to tell him, he told him we can hold San Antonio. And so the men decided they were going to hold San Antonio, and Jim, even when he got down on his health, and even when Colonel Travis drew a line in the sand, and I love what I see here, protecting all things Texas. That was the mindset of these patriots at that time, protecting all things Texas. So Colonel Travis drew the line in the sand. And legend has it that Jim Boyd, because of his health, he was not able to do what was requested of the men at the time. History tells us that they were told all those that's willing to put their lives on the line for freedom's cause, and I'm paraphrasing, cross this line. Legend says that even though we only had about 200 defenders, those defenders believed that Texas was, was so worth it that they crossed that line. And Jim, though he could not physically get up, he had the men to carry him, carry him across that line. So today I ask you, how many of you all are willing to stand up and say, if you have to carry me, I'm willing to stand up for Texas, I'm willing to stand up for the monuments, and I'm willing to stand up for history today. They stood up, there was a red flag, and that red flag signified that they were willing to go ahead and just lay down arms. But Santa Ana, as history tells us, Santa Ana decided that there's going to be no surrender. No man would be left alive. Not one would be left alive. Even though he saw the red flag, history tells us everyone was to die. Think about this for a moment. As I shared quite a while back, by this point, the bodies that were lying next to these patriots no doubt had begun to smell. The smell of death was amongst them. No doubt that these patriots knew that our time was coming. No doubt they knew that we were going to have to sacrifice it all. This is the history they're trying to erase. When they remove a monument like the Cenotaph, when they decide they want to destroy the Alamo, when they decide they want to reimagine the Alamo, they're trying to reimagine history. They're trying to rewrite history. And it takes people like TITFF to stand up and say, not on my watch. That's why I drive to a place like this. That's why my wife and I look and we leave from one speaking engagement to the next because it's so worth it. It's so worth it. It would take these 200 or so defenders to die. And those that did not die, legend tells us that Santa Ana took them out and had his men to burn them. 
burned them. They were tortured before they were burned. Yet, we have people that want to erase this history. I need you all to understand that word spread about this. Word spread about what happened with these 200 defenders. And as word spread, legend tells us, and history tells us, that the army began to grow. Yes. Patriots and citizens decided if that's what happened to those 200 defenders, even those that were not up for this battle, they said, we're going to do the right thing. If that's what they did to 200 defenders, we're going to stand up. The army began to grow. And at times, Sam Houston, he took that army. And in 18 minutes, although it took 90 minutes at the Battle of Alamo, San Jacinto, 18 minutes later, San and Santa Anta and his people gave up. They gave up. They gave up. This is the history they're trying to erase. Why is it important to protect these monuments? Like it, love it, or hate it, we have to protect the monument. I said many times in the past, even if you hate a monument, that should ignite you to do something opposite of what you hate. But don't destroy the history. Don't destroy the truth. How many of us have benefited from history? And how many of the people in the generations past have benefited from it? We don't destroy it. We tell the history. We learn from the history. We grow from the history. We teach from the history. We redirect from the history. But we don't destroy the history. We don't destroy it. I want to share with you all just some closing thoughts. Some closing thoughts that I shared at the Alamo some time back. The cost is too great. That's what I shared at the time. The cost is too great. We must stand up and be voices for we the people. We're being ignored. Representative Slavey mentioned that. And I echo it. It feels like we're being ignored. We had monument protection as one of the legislative priorities for the Republican Party of Texas. That monument protection priority it came from the body of people at our convention. That group of delegates at the convention were selected and elected by we the people. Yet by the time we get just a handful of legislative parties and money protection being one, we have people that are in Austin, unlike our dear friend here, Representative Slayton, that's refusing to stand up and do the right thing. I had someone over the last 72 hours that I didn't realize how important monument protection was. But I do now. It's not just about a statue. It's not just about a marker. It's not just about a park. It's about the history that's tied to it. It's about the untold stories that until someone sees the monument, how many of you, by show of hands, you saw a monument, and it wasn't until you saw the monument that you learned about that history? It wasn't until you saw it that you learned about that history. It wasn't until you had people like Representative Slayton that tells you about photos that were hanging in Austin that you learned about that history. It wasn't until someone told you about something they saw that you learned about that history. I always say, at what point will it be something that you enjoy? At what point will it be a monument that you love? That someone on the other side says, you took down one of ours, now it's time to take down one of yours. And at what point do we take down all these monuments? And at what point is all that history destroyed? The cost is too great. The cost is too great. If 200 voices saying we refuse to quit stood up, if the patriots saying that my Texas, my freedom, and my future generations, they're worth my life, if they did that, who are we this day and time not to do the same? If a rally cry to the world says that I may be the underdog, but get ready for the fight of your life. If the 200 said that through their actions, we may be on the dogs, but get ready for the fight of your life. We may be outnumbered, but get ready for the fight of your life. We may be counted out, but get ready for the fight of your life. Oh, come on. T-I-T-F-F might be outnumbered, but they come with a spirit of saying, get ready for the fight of your life. Patriots, if we stand down now, it will be difficult for us to stand up later. The battle today is about freedom. And it's about ensuring elected 
and appointed tyrants are held accountable to we the people. It's about making sure that we're drawing the line in the sand saying we refuse to quit. We refuse to fight without fighting for freedom, liberty, and everything else at all costs that matter to us and the next generation. Defenders, they taught us a couple things. They taught us it only takes a few to stand up and fight against the odds in the face of adversity. They taught us that we must fight for the patriots next to us and the freedoms for the next generation. They taught us that we must see something greater than the right now. You all see something greater than the right now. You see tomorrow. You see next year. You see the next decade. You see the next generation. And you're saying, not on my watch. Not on my watch. Not on my watch. It's time, patriots, that we hold those that are elected and appointed accountable. It's time that we replace the tyrants, ignoring the voices of we the people. It's time that we recruit, we resource, and run replacements for the flagrant politicians. It's time that we organize a political, social, and economic and legal battle for the ages and shape the rebellion of those that are standing up against that which is right and that which our Constitution of Constitutional rights tell us that we must fight for. In close, I'll tell you all that we gotta rise up. We have to rise up. You all have taken a stand. I told you once before, and I'll echo what I said before, it only takes one match to start a forest fire. It only takes one of you to ignite change. Just one of you to ignite change. One thing that we can assure one another, if we fight for the person to the right of us, and we fight for the person to the left of us, and we make sure that we're confident with the person at our 6 o'clock. And we're confident in protecting those people that we're holding their six. That means we're surrounded by people that we can call our battle buddies. And when we can go out in battles knowing that we got God in front of us and patriots around us, what do we have to fear? What do we have to fear? What do we have to fear? My challenge and my charge to you as I close is that we have people in Austin like Representative Slate. There's no reason we shouldn't be filling the coffers of people like Representative Slate. All it takes is one representative like him to get backers like you to spread, spread the word throughout the great state of Texas and this nation to say, you know what, in Austin, Texas, he may have enemies, and those enemies may be representatives, they may be state senators, but guess what? We're going to send him some allies because we're going to start replacing his enemies. like-minded people. So in close, I want to thank you all for giving me the time, giving me the opportunity, and giving me the platform to address you all. I want to encourage you all to keep the fight up. I want to encourage you all to do just as your slogan say, this is Texas Freedom Force, protector of all things Texas. Continue to protect, continue to serve, continue to believe, and continue to give God the glory as all these things are done with great success. May God bless you, may he bless the great state of Texas, and may he bless the United States of America. Thank you again for your time. God bless you.